Today's virtual presentation is titled Hashtag Tech Dilemma, Student Professionalism in the Digital Age, brought to you by the American Dental Education Association. Before the webinar, we engage you on Twitter and invite you to share your comments on Twitter and follow our live tweets during the webinar and follow the conversation using the hashtag, Hashtag Tech Dilemma. Now it's my pleasure to introduce your host, Dr. Eugene Anderson, who is the Chief Policy Officer and Managing Vice President of the American Dental Education Association. Dr. Anderson leads the IDEA Policy Center, which provides evidence-based research and uh, uh, analysis, collaborative advocacy, and thoughtful leadership. The IDEA Policy Center works through four targeted portfolios, including access, diversity, and inclusion, advocacy, and governmental relations, education research and analysis, and institutional capacity building. We're pleased that Dr. Anderson could join us today and host today's webinar. Dr. Anderson, the audience is all yours. Thank you for the introduction, Bobby. We're glad to have you with us for this webinar. For today's webinar, we are fortunate to have Drs. Marilyn Lance and Phyllis Beamstabur with us to share their expertise on student ethics and professionalism. Dr. Lance is Professor of Dentistry in the Department of Periodontics and Oral Medicine at the University of Michigan School of Dentistry. Dr. Beamstabur is Professor and former Associate Dean for Academic Affairs in the School of Dentistry at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. Today's webinar will enable participants to understand the current landscape of professionalism in technology and social media. We will outline some recent policy changes governing ethics and professionalism and investigate ways to assess students for their potential ethical problems before they occur. So let's start our conversation today with Dr. Lance. I'd like to start with the question, how has the use of electronic media, social media, challenged our thinking about professional behavior in dentistry? Thanks very much, Eugene, uh, for the nice introduction. Um, I think that uh, one way to start this conversation about thinking is to make the case that professional behavior in general is defined in our professional codes, the ADA code, the ADHA code, and the ASDA codes in particular, and also in some cases uh, in institutional policy that may be unique at different schools. Um, I think the challenge is to apply these principles of professional behavior um, when using digital communication. And I think that's um, sometimes not so simple, so we'll talk a bit more about this. Um, in uh, about 2012, the American College of Dentists uh, published a position paper on the use of digital communication in dentistry. And it listed eight principles that should be adhered to, um, the first of which, when using digital communication, is on the slide. And it says that the professional relationship between the dentist and patient should not be compromised by the use of digital communication. Again, this reinforcing the idea that the professional behaviors that are codified for us by our professional organizations are still in effect uh, when using uh, digital communication. Interestingly, um, when one looks at the ADA code, the ADHA code, and the ASDA codes, they don't particularly have items that address digital communication. So how can one begin to think about applying these sort of general professional behaviors and obligations that are codified for us, okay, in the context of, you know, using digital communication? So I, I kind of wanted to touch on um, some of these 
I think, behaviors and obligations that I think are really paramount. And they're very important to us as professionals in honoring the social contract. Each of our professions has a contract with the public called the social contract that tells the public what kinds of behaviors they can expect from dental professionals and ensures them that ensures the public that they can trust the profession. And if you look on the bottom of the slide, we, we put the word trust kind of in big letters because trust is the basis of the social contract. If the public begins to feel or patients begin to feel that they can't trust us, then we will violate the social contract. And I think in that case, what's a jeopardy is our very status as a profession. Okay. That status we don't grant ourselves. That status is granted to the profession by society. So let's look at some of these um, general professional obliga uh, obligations. First, um, protecting patients from harm. This is sort of uh, the most stringent of all of our obligations. Um, mainly we all do this by maintaining competence, right? We make sure our skills and our knowledge are current. But also, protecting patients from harm involves ideas like protecting patients' personal information and ensuring that in the course of uh, engaging in our relationship with our patients that we don't cause them any discomfort or embarrassment, right? And so social media, for example, and other forms of digital communication are potential ways that we could do this. And so we have to think about that. We also want to protect and foster the patient's autonomy. We want to protect patients' confidentiality and all of their information. We want to put patients' welfare first, right? Uh, and we do that in many ways. We, but paramount in our thinking is what is in the best interest of our patients, the public, and their oral health. Uh, we want to protect the health of the public. And we want to ensure through our behavior that the public can trust dentists, dental hygienists, and the dental professions. We want to be fair in our dealings with patients, colleagues, and society. Again, this deals with trustworthiness. And we want to be honest and trustworthy in our dealings with people. We have to always keep at the, I think, paramount in our considerations that as dental professionals, we have a fiduciary relationship with our patients. That's a special relationship of trust, right? Personal integrity, of course, is key here. So, again, um, my main point here is that our status as professions relies on us maintaining the public trust, and we have to do that across the board, okay? And that's um, with and, you know, in the digital environment and otherwise. So, um, I think that electronic media present us with enormous opportunities uh, in the dental professions, as well as some opportunities for challenges to professionalism. So we, some of these opportunities include enhancing our interactions with patients in very profound ways. Uh, for example, we can use these media to help educate patients. We can help patients find really good sources of information about their oral health, okay? And uh, we can um, post materials, educational materials, for example, on our website. Um, we can engage patients to improve their compliance with keeping themselves healthy. Um, we can enhance the sharing of information for team-based care and in team-based care settings. So there are many, many terrific enhancements that we can make to the care we provide our patients using electronic media. If you look uh, particularly at social media, uh, social media has become really important in our society. Um, in particular, it's 
in many ways, redefined marketing of services uh, in our society. If you think about social coupons, for example, goods and services, um, it allows us to engage simultaneously wider audiences. Um, we have ex- uh, expectations uh, in the current culture that we will be savvy and we will have abilities to use these media. I think patients expect it. Um, we've seen measurable results from the use of social media, for example, in attracting new patients to practices. Social media can be used to build community. It can be used to enhance our professional reputation. Uh, again, I mentioned um, a moment ago educating patients and the public. Uh, and then also it offers greater networking opportunities, uh, for example, via interactive sites. So um, let's kind of switch now and talk a little bit about um, challenges to professionalism that can arise through the use of digital media. First and foremost, I think, is uh, this issue of potential threats to patient confidentiality, privacy, and respect for persons. Um, Email is wonderful, powerful, But again, I think one has to really think through the kinds of information one puts in emails with patients and um, when and how to use that vehicle. One has to think about issues such as um, is the information encrypted, right, if you're sharing certain kinds of information. Uh, So that arena, again, while it can be very helpful, also has some pitfalls to be aware of. Another issue is uh, this potential of blurring professional and personal boundaries. Um, Sometimes um, patients um, want to friend healthcare providers, uh, and um, these dual relationships can get extremely complicated. So professionals need to really think through this issue about how one shows up for patients digitally, right, and how those relationships can uh, be negotiated. We're going to talk a little bit more about this in a minute. Um, Risks of venting in online forums. Uh, There have been incidents um, in which uh, professionals have chosen to do, you know, to vent, and those um, really can be problematic because, again, if dentists make insulting comments about patients, um, if dental hygienists make other kinds of inappropriate comments about patients, about colleagues, um, you know, engage in this sort of behavior, The net effect is that the trust that the public has in both individual dental professionals and in the professions themselves can be undermined. Um, The issue of online personas, I think, is an incredibly interesting one. Um, I think that um, one has to sort of think through uh, who am I when I show up online. Do I want to have two personas? Do I want to be the professional and do I want to have a personal persona? If I do that, how do I keep those personas separate? The interesting thing for me about this is, you know, in in the in professional identity formation, um, we are helping our students develop so that they incorporate the values of the profession into who they are, into their personas. Um, this, you know, having uh, these kinds of uh, dual relationships w- with uh, patients uh, can become risky. This sort of this, uh, refers also to this blurring of professional and personal boundaries. But I also think it's really hard to, um, for people to maintain separate personas. So that's, I, I leave you to think about that. Um, and again, the big issue here is always realizing that when we show up as professionals, online or otherwise, 
We never show up just as a private person because we, our behavior reflects on our entire profession. And that's just what it means to be part of a collective called a profession. Uh, Marilyn, let me ask you a question because this discussion of this differentiation between the professional persona and the, and the personal persona and understanding how one shows up and what that means, you know, it makes me think about some, some incidents that have occurred over the past year and one that comes to mind involved a elementary school teacher who had some inappropriate personal postings on her personal Facebook site nothing related directly to her classroom, but the school district ended up um, reprimanding her and I think maybe even firing her because the notion was as a educator, she should present herself in all aspects in a very professional manner. So what's your take on that notion of even if it's the personal space and it's not anything uh, related to practice, um, how dentists and dental hygienists should appear. Any insight or thoughts for our audience? Uh, sure, Eugene. That's a fantastic question, and I, I think it does get to exactly the heart of some of the things I've been uh, talking about. Uh, I think the issue is that if you can be identified as a professional, if you're, going, if you're showing up anywhere as a dentist, okay, um, that, you know, the rules apply, <laughs> you know, our professional obligations are there. And I, I personally but would make the case that they're there even when we show up as private citizens, um, which I think, you know, is a higher standard. But I think it's very hard to sort of take on and, and you know, put on and take off these personas. So, you know, I think, it again, it requires a lot of thought, and I think that, um, you know, that we will be judged. I also think that at times, you know, you can be in a situation where you're trying to show up as a, as a private citizen, perhaps, but if you're identifiable and people know that you're a dental professional, you will still have issues. Understood, understood. Okay. All right. So, anyway, that's certainly my two cents, and, you know, I would love to hear other people's thoughts on this issue. Um, so, I think, uh, I'm sorry, I think I've got a head on this, or, or a head for some reason on the slide. Let me go back. Here we go. Um, so, um, additionally, we have, you know, always to keep in mind that, there is a potential with the use of digital media for uncontrolled dissemination, right? Once it's out there, we, don't, we can't control where information goes. And also the permanence of online posting. And I think this is something to particularly think about um, for uh, uh, students because of the possibility of career threats, right? Student posts something, it's out there. Uh, potential employers find the material and make an assessment about the individual based on that material. There can also be legal ramifications, you know, and, I, and that immediately makes me think of, you know, violating um, patient confidentiality uh, and that sort of thing. Um, we did include um, a reference by uh, Parkinson and Turner that I, I would encourage uh, everyone to take a look at because it really is a terrific review uh, of the legal issues, and um, I think it, it's really a great read. Um, I think also we have this issue of needing to manage our digital image. Um, it's really frustrating, I think, uh, for um, health professionals, not just um, dental professionals, um, to, you know, be sort of enrolled in these uh, uh, rating sites. Um, because there's really very little recourse that professionals have to address misinformation directly um, that it turns up in these sites. Um, probably the best that one can do is to use one's website uh, to really maintain one's digital reputation. There are ways to do it. 
But, you know, in terms of legally, uh, professionals who've tried to fight um, information put on these rating sites by patients haven't done well. So uh, that's something to think a lot about, I think, how you want to do that. Uh, pitfalls with practice websites. Um, I, I guess I have um, a fair bit of peer review experience, and I can tell you that uh, one of the big issues that uh, dentists have run into is this idea of posting any material that's false or misleading in a material respect. The the uh, this is at least for ADA members. Um, the ADA code uh, in its section on advertising discusses that it is unethical to, in any communications, to uh, provide false or misleading information or information that's false or misleading in a material respect is the language that they use. So for me, this raises issues such as if you want to put information for patients on your website, making sure that it's up to date. Uh, if you um, have a particular philosophy of practice that you want to share um, with patients and the public, to make sure that you have information that's balanced, correct, that's supported by evidence on the site. And these are, you know, or that you're not making claims that you can't back up, claims about the care you provide, for example, that can't be backed up by research and by data. So these are the sorts of things that, you know, over the years I've seen, um, you know, coming up in peer review. And I think it's really important to make our students aware of these issues so that, you know, and, uh, also if they want to design a website that uh, many times the website designers aren't aware of our professional obligations and so you have to work with a designer and really be vigilant about that. Uh, Marilyn, let me ask you a question because this certainly shows just how technology is changing the environment in which we practice in. So can you briefly comment on how has this impacted the conversations that dental educators have with their students? Yeah, so, I mean, this is, you know, um, the the... I guess at the crux of the conversation, I mean, you want to talk about all of these things. Um, sorry, I'm going in the wrong direction. Um, you want to talk about all of these things with students. And uh, so talking with them about all of these potential challenges I think is really important. I think it's important for schools to have social media policies that are clear and easy to interpret to give students and all community members guidelines. Um, maintaining the trust of the public in the dental and allied dental professions is extremely important, and I think we really all need to understand that and help the students understand that. We have to protect our patients' privacy, confidentiality requirements, the ethical and legal. Ethical principles don't vary much, but legal uh, principles and legal requirements can vary quite a bit by jurisdiction. Um, managing patients' expectations for communication. How available are you going to be? What kind of response time, okay, are you going to have for inquiries and interaction with patients? And then, again, here, too, there's all these complexities if you have dual relationships with patients, both personal and professional, if you go in that direction. So these, these are all part of the conversation, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Beamsterberg. Certainly, there is a lot that is, is being discussed at institutions across the country related to these matters. Can you tell us what does the research and literature say around the types of unprofessional behavior students in all of the health professions uh, might be exhibiting? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Eugene. Yes, the... Um it's amazing that we have over 3 billion people using the Internet. These amazing numbers are part of our daily life now. And the research on these communication tools is uh, in its infancy. But the concerns about unprofessionalism are present and are reflected in some of these studies that I'll share with you. These numbers are not large, but they are still of concern. One study that looked at medical blogs 
This was a Robert Wood Johnson supported study. And blogs are a new connection between the healthcare providers and the public. And this study looked at um, what they could identify in medical blogs, and they found it almost over 55, 56%, the author was identifiable. Further, 16.6%, the patient or the doctor was identifiable in the blog itself. So even though these blogs are a new connection, there is a risk of reflecting poorly on the author's and on the profession. Now, we know that overt violations of patient privacy are rare, but this does give us some indication that there are cautions to be followed. Interestingly, too, in this same study, they found that healthcare products in the blogs were promoted in almost 12% of these uh, communications. Another study on what is happening in medical schools, found that uh, a survey, and this was uh, with 78 allopathic medical schools, that 60% reported having to address students who posted unprofessional conduct, including breaches of patient confidentiality online. This included profanity and some discriminatory languages, uh, some discriminatory language. Now, this same article talked about that there were actual dismissals as a result of some of this conduct. Now, dismissals for professional lapses in schools of medicine as are, are rare, as they are in dental schools, less than 1%. But it is still concerning that these levels of reporting were um, being uh, found in these various schools. The good news on this uh, same study that they shared was that the discussion about the topic, so in other words, when they went and spoke with students, um, talked about these issues, it led to an 80% decrease in the publicly accessible accounts with this same cohort. So the good news is that the education around these topics resulted in a behavior change in these uh, students. Another study uh, from a group out of Florida, and they have done several of these looking at violations and unprofessional conduct, uh, they found some Facebook posts that uh, included patient privacy. But then a further look at this, that most of these occurred on mission trips where they were taking photos of patients. Um, And again, when the students were educated about how the Facebook post did violate the confidentiality of these patients, whether they're in the United States or in a foreign country, the publicly accessible information did decrease significantly. So the training issue during whether they're on site or in someplace else is to remind them of the of, of our professional principles and how important they are. Another study with uh, medical residents, again with Facebook, uh, found, this is a pretty good-sized study, that there were um, about 14 to 12% looking at how they um, categorized the various um, differences in what they looked at. Um, This group actually took some of the graduate medical education and the American Medical Association components of professionalism, and that's how they made their stratification, looking at what was potentially unprofessional conduct and then what was clear unprofessional conduct. So things that are um, uh, exactly the, the area that was professional um, these slides are jumping around, aren't they? The potentially unprofessional conduct was things like binge drinking, sexually suggestive photos, and uh, things of that nature, whereas the stuff that was clear unprofessional contact was HIPAA violations and confidentiality issues. Now, the disturbing piece about this one study um, was that 
this did not decrease with training. So this group did not show that they responded to the educational discussions in their, in their curriculum. Well, Phyllis, this is certainly some very revealing information. I think this is a good time to, to add our own informal data point to the discussion. So we have a poll question for all of our participants asking the following. Have you seen examples of unprofessional social media use by dental, allied dental, and advanced dental education students? Uh, you can respond no, yes at least once, yes two to three times, or yes more than three times. Uh, Bobby, any additional instructions? At this time, yeah. Just all you have to do is uh, choose the uh, option that is best for you, and then once you do that, uh, we will be collecting that information and sharing it with you in just a few moments. And as I'm speaking, the, uh, the responses are still coming in. We've got about half of our respondents that have chosen, and we're going to keep it here just for a few more minutes until we get everybody everybody has a chance to go ahead and choose the response that is best for them. We've got about 77% of our respondents that have chosen. And we're up to about 84%, 85% now. Bobby, let's give uh, folks 15 more seconds, okay? Sounds good. Can we get 90% response rate, folks? Let's got five more seconds. <laughs> All right, there we go. We've got 90% response rate. I'm closing the poll now. And would you like me to publish that poll so everybody can see it? Yes, please do. All right, so really interesting. Thanks for everybody for responding. So any comments, Marilyn or Phyllis? Looks like we had a fourth of, of our respondents say no, and then the rest are, are sp spread out, uh, and we do have 19% that have seen a lot. 29% uh, the highest group that have seen at least one and then another a quarter of folks that have seen two to three. Uh, surprising, not surprising, Phyllis or Marilyn? I, actually, I don't think it's surprising at all because the, depending on the age of these respondents and their use of social media, so possibly the younger cohorts may have been more involved and have seen things where some of us who are tending more to the gray hair uh, might be not as comfortable using these mo uh, modes and so would not have uh, observed any examples of unprofessional usage. Definitely, definitely. Well, well, let's continue. So, Dr. Bingstaber, what else does the research tell us about unprofessional conduct? Well, um, actually, we have one study. If we could get the slides back up. There we go. Thank you. Um, well, we have one study done in a dental school, a very nice study done by Henry and Molnar, and they uh, looked at Facebook profiles and they had uh, their sample size, they had 61% actually of their uh, student body did have Facebook um, accounts. So they did something similar to some other research uh, in medical schools and they broke it down in the unprofessional conduct column by substance abuse, sexism, racism, privacy violations, lack of respect for professors or college, and then other unprofessional conduct. And this group, if you look over on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see the total numbers, even though they are smaller in one group and larger in the other, you get some indication that there were issues to be found among this group of 239 students. Um, you know, substance abuse, that probably did include uh, binge drinking type of things and possibly use of drugs or other things. Certainly the sexism and racism are 
um, disturbing and should be, of course, at zero. Privacy violations, those were the kind of things like they had pictures of patients in the dental chair. And on further look, these were usually the first patient, possibly a family member, so they've probably felt more comfortable taking those kinds of photographs. Um, other things like lack of respect for professors and or the college, disturbing as that may be to some of us, included things like boring lectures and sleeping in class. Other professional um, other unprofessional conduct included something um, that they classified as excessive profanity. So as a result of this study, the um, authors did call for awareness um, and the encouraging of policies for students so that they understand where these boundaries may be as they are uh, learning in their particular programs. I just want to comment to um, the article that is being uh, available for you that Marilyn and I put on there is an excellent paper, uh, a journal of dental education paper from November of 2014, which does address some of the legal issues that we will be struggling with for some time to come because of the free speech challenges that are evolving and that will play out um, as we get more and more information around this topic. Uh, Phyllis, regarding these findings and the earlier study that you mentioned that looked at Facebook posts, I have a question. I'm noticing several of our participants have noted that their institution um, suggests or requires or recommends that faculty do not friend students on, in, in things like Facebook. So the question is raised then, how can faculty monitor um, this type of social media activity? And it, it seems that part of what we're talking about also requires some peer-to-peer -peer monitoring amongst the students. Um, what do you think? Oh, absolutely. And I think we're going to have some issues uh, as different institutions develop their policies and they continue to do things like say, do not friend um, students uh, in this context. And a lot of the public literature also says the same thing. But I think in an educational institution, we're going to have to um, be a little bit flexible as we learn about this. For instance, a, you know, a disagreement um, played out on Facebook can actually cause a great riff among a class where they, it's their Facebook page and there is a disagreement between two individuals. Um, in one uh, instance that I'm aware of, the finally the students came forward to the administration to get some help in how to solve this because it had polarized the group so greatly that they were disturbed by it. So I think we will be challenged as we move forward. All right, thank you. Well, for any listeners who have recently joined the webinar, welcome. Today's topic, hashtag tech dilemma, student professionalism in the digital age, is being presented by the IDEA Policy Center, which supports IDEA's role as the voice of dental education. My name is Dr. Eugene Anderson, and I'm the IDEA Chief Policy Officer and Managing Vice President. To learn more about the IDEA Policy Center, we encourage you to visit the IDEA website at www.idea.org and click on the Policy tab. Be sure to stay connected as we continue to share more information about IDEA's policy efforts. Joining us for this webinar today are Drs. Gimstaber and Lance. And now let me turn it back over to Bobby, who is going to take a minute here to do a total head count of all our participants today. Bobby? All right, thank you very much. And on your screen right now, uh, you should see um, an attendance poll. And on that attendance poll, all you have to do is enter in the amount of people that are in your group, okay? And if the, if there are 10 of you in your group, simply enter the number that is in your group. We're going to leave this up for about 30 seconds or so, and just go ahead and enter the number of people attending at your site today in the space below. We'll give you about another 10 seconds.
All right, and thank you very much for your participation. And the floor is all yours once again, Dr. Anderson. All right, thank you, Bobby. So turning back to Dr. Lance, there is an IDEA statement on professionalism in dental education, which was approved by the IDEA House of Delegates in 2009. Is this statement in combination with other professional codes still relevant today? Um, excuse me. Thank you, Jean. Um, the, the six values defining professionalism in dental education um, were developed essentially to link to the, our professional codes, all of them for, for dental professionals. And, our, and those links are actually in the document. And uh, so they're designed, they were designed to align with the ethical principles espoused in dental and allied dental professional codes. Um, these values include competence, fairness, integrity, responsibility, respect, and service-mindedness. And these are all values, really, we've been talking about today. Um, also, ADEA developed a tool for action on professionalism in dental education. Um, I would suggest... Um, looking at it, it's, I think, extremely helpful uh, for individuals interested in doing a self-assessment in professionalism, and it's applicable to dental students, educators, and administrators as well. To answer your question, I believe that uh, these values um, uh, are um, relevant and the statement is relevant uh, today just as it was at the time that it was written because it, um, uh, it, it's updated as the codes are updated because of the links. So that's my take on it. Uh, Phyllis, how should we prepare our students to manage the challenges to professional behavior posed by the use of electronic media? Thank you, Eugene. Um, yeah, I think we need to um, kind of keep in mind a little bit of the differences in the cohorts that we are training. There's been a general societal trend to be more open and to share more personal information. We all have seen that with our students. Our students are a product of society's new openness, and we have to think about what people are willing to share about themselves with others that perhaps... Uh, in previous uh, generations, we did not do that. So it's, it's even a little bit more than the blurring. It's folks are willing to share some personal information in the past that would have never been shared. So we need to understand that as we try to inculcate the professional values that, man, that matter to us. This generation reflects what's happening in society. They're very big on personal expression. They're also very big on what kind of lifestyle choices that they want to follow. But the idea of what their professional responsibilities are are part of what we are training them for. So exploring the, perce the perceptions that they have, what their persona is, is important to us. In addition, we also have to look at what we're actually training around. And the communication and the confidentiality breaches in this process, the learning process, is uh, what we have to introduce them to, have to help them reinforce in any type of a clinical setting, and what these demands mean for them, whether it's the uh, federal demands, the codes that we adhere to, and the confidentiality that we are trying to um, make them understand. And the exuberance and the love of each other that they bring, as you can see on the slides, we want to temper that with what those responsibilities are. Maryland uh, mentioned earlier a little bit about professional uh, identity formation. And there's a, quite a bit of evidence uh, suggesting that our students enter professional education. Some of them may have not achieved some of these key transitions in identity formation. Think back to Kohlberg and Piaget and how the moral development occurs. 
So professional identity is an important outcome of professional education and the socialization process. We're uh, forging, if you will, a professional identity that requires the integration and weaving of professional values and expectations with personal ones. So it's sort of a coming together to have that one professional identity. And we explore this with students in, by using cases, by coaching, by discussions, um, and the most important probably, some role modeling of how we handle that and how we deal with our patients both in person and online. So, so Phyllis, can you talk about how you apply these principles of professional behavior in the context of social media? Absolutely. So we, um, we'd like to offer some guidelines for professionals and this is sort of guidelines for the changing landscape of social media and social networking. And really what these are is we're asking them to hold, uh, hold to our principles of respect, confidentiality, and fairness. And we have four here that I would like to um, suggest. Uh, one is that we, when you're going online with any communication tool, that you carefully review anything and everything that is posted online for its communication value and tone. Rereading to be sure that it's what you are wanting the result to say. Secondly, this is used a lot in the lay literature, pause before posting. I think it's a good little phrase to keep in mind. We want to be vigilant uh, about striving to maintain our personal and our professional integrity, whether that has been come, become blurred or not. And we also want to be very vigilant about safeguarding health information privacy. <clears throat> Violations around that could be very disturbing and costly. Then the issue of friending. Generally, when you look through the literature, and the professional literature in the healthcare fields, whether you're talking pharmacy, medicine, or dentistry, do not friend or like patients on any social networking site. Don't post any, obviously, patient information. Avoid comments about care and treatment. It just makes it easier and cleaner. It's important to know the rules about social media if you are uh, who you, you are employed by or the related institutions. For instance, having um, a video of a end-of-the-year roast and uh, talent show may be just fine to video that for a class, but putting it on YouTube may violate some institutional policies. So it's important to know what those are. We thought that um, one of the um, things to remember for some of us in, who have been in education for some time, that these uh, challenges are there for us. They're just another necessary accommodation in a rapidly e evolving world, and we um, need to be able to collaborate and improvise most effectively. And obviously, we're not the first ones. Well, Phyllis, what, what additional advice would you have for our students, residents, and fellows? We know we have a large number with us for this webinar today. So what advice would you give them regarding online image? Yes, absolutely. Um, just some simple things to keep in mind because the online, online image is important and it can impact the professional life of the dentist or the dental hygienist. So, posting is public. Presume permanency. Anything that goes on digitally can be retrieved. Anyone, including students, should monitor their privacy settings and watch that when the changes occur in the various carriers, such as Facebook, that you are carefully knowing that what those changes are and how they reflect on what you're doing. Review any photos and videos 
for what they may be stating or what they may be revealing about you. Facebook is ubiquitous. It is part of life. Healthcare professionals use it, but we have those additional responsibilities to make sure that we maintain our professionalism. Thank you, Phyllis. We have a few minutes left to answer some additional questions from our participants, so I will I will start with my first question. Uh, Scott wants to know, do any dental school-based faculty practices have, informa- have an information officer that monitors or addresses the digital reputation of its faculty practitioner- practitioners? Um, any, any awareness regarding this at your institution or any uh, others that you know of? I am not, uh, this is Phyllis, I am not aware of any. Uh, nor am I, this is Marilyn. Uh, next question, we touched on this briefly, but just want to be clear, is it your sense that faculty are responsible for monitoring the social media activity of students? No, I don't think they're responsible for it unless they become involved in it some way. And this uh, goes back to the careful use of um when you go on any Facebook site, and it may be inappropriate even for a faculty member to, say, for instance, join a Facebook site that belongs to a class unless they were involved, uh, they have a specific reason for being there. And it's interesting related to this notion of faculty awareness of student activity and to friend and not to friend. Several people have noted that although Many academic dental institutions have policies suggesting that faculty not friend students. Uh, that doesn't always apply once they graduate, and, 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 and the way this social media web is connected may then um, connect faculty to current students. So any thoughts or in terms of concerns that faculty should be aware of, or students as well? Are there any people that students should block? Um, yeah, these, these are um, interesting questions. I guess, um, you know, maybe the whole, you know, really thinking hard about privacy settings, you know, and, you know, once you join something, you know, what are the, you know, can you foresee some of the long-range consequences? So these are these are not simple issues. All right, and a final question relates to, well, I just want to say there's certainly been a comment regarding the value of having a discussion on this topic involving students. Uh, We certainly realize that, and IDEA will look to work with its Council on Students, Residents, and Fellows in the future for an opportunity to have this uh, same similar discussion at at some upcoming forum or web activity. So we definitely want to continue to engage students around this topic. Any final thoughts from our discussion leaders today, Phyllis or Marilyn, any closing comments? Sure. Uh, I I think that it's very important uh, to realize that uh, expecting our students to understand all of the potential pitfalls for dental professionals um, using uh, digital media is a bit unfair. And and I would say ditto in some cases for the faculty. Um, So, uh, therefore, I think that the the dental educators have an obligation to discuss these issues with students at all levels and to provide opportunities for them to practice resolving dilemmas that arise in the use of digital media by dental professionals and and to make that as a personal experience. Um, The other thing is, uh, and this brings me back around to faculty as well, I think having clear school policies that offer guidance for the use of digital media by members of the school community can be extremely helpful. Um, 
I think that, uh, you know, it's anything that we can do to make the expectations clear because I always feel if, you know, expectations aren't clear, then, you know, it can be very unfair to people. Um, so I think that's important. I would agree with Marilyn that, you know, this, these topics of professionalism in our communication tools is, is an important one for students and as well as practitioners. And, and really, as students, we should be addressing this using whatever tools that we have at our, um, such as case analysis and things of that nature. Clearly, the ethics courses could address some of these, these topics very easily. But keeping our ethical principles and values foremost will help all of us uh, in our communications and using things appropriately so that we do the the foremost we can to preserve the trust in the uh, dental therapeutic relationships. Thank you both. And before we close out, I, I do want to ask our participants to, uh, to to help us as we continue to look at this issue. Several people have noted that it would be very informative to have a sense of the policies that are out there at our various institutions and programs related to professionalism and the use of social media. So I would like to ask anyone who has a policy related to these any of these topics to send them to idea policy center at idea.org and we will then uh, if you are open to it we'll, we'll share those with our participants in our follow-up resources I think that will certainly should be helpful and informative to all of us so with that, I want to thank everyone for participating in today's discussion. We'll be back with you later this summer in August with our next webinar. More information to come, but stay tuned for that. And with that, I'll turn it over to Bobby. All right. Thank you very much. And that is going to conclude today's event, Hashtag Tech Dilemma, Student Professionalism in the Digital Age, brought to you by the American Dental Education Association. And even though our program has come to an end, we do encourage you to continue to engage in the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag uh, Tech Dilemma. Adia will appreciate you filling out the evaluation for this webinar, and in a moment your computer will be redirected to that evaluation page. And after filling out the evaluation, you'll have the opportunity to download and save a copy of your CE verification form. If you're participating as a group, you will need to add your name and email address to the site roster in order to be sent that evaluation. Once again, that site roster uh, can be located at the site roster icon in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. If you have any questions, feel free to call KRM Customer Service at 1-800-775-7654. Today's program is copyrighted in 2015 by the American Dental Education Association, all rights reserved. Thank you very much for joining us today, and enjoy the rest of your day.